Good morning. I'm Dr. Gorlitsky. Uh, today I wanted to um, kind of do an audio presentation and go along with the PowerPoint slide that I did for the residents over here in South Carolina um, and for the medical students on hyponatremia. So full disclosure, I'm actually the CEO and co-founder of Kidney Aid LLC or ureaaid.com. Um, we actually are distributors of two different ureas. We have our unflavored, self-flavored uh, bulk urea aid urea, which has one ingredient, 100% USP grade urea. Um, this can be used very effectively mixed with powdered Gatorade, powdered Kool-Aid, or uh, any kind of like juice. We've had patients use pineapple juice. Uh, for example, or orange juice with a little stevia. Um, and we are actually 60% uh, lower cost than the U.S. competitor. We also have a premium packet um, that's individual dose packet. Those are 15 grams, um, and that's about 30% lower cost than our competitor. Um, both can be purchased directly through our website at ureaaid.com. Uh, we do sell internationally. Um, and we are also on Amazon and can be found on Amazon.com as well. So just look up ureaaid.com or ureaaid on Amazon and you'll be able to find us pretty easily. And we've shipped all over the world, including Mexico, Canada, Australia, uh, uh, lots of countries in Europe. So, um, and I'm going to kind of skip through a lot of the details of the presentation just kind of go through some of the basics and I think the audience that I'm speaking to here are um, pretty sophisticated and kind of understand the scope of the problem and don't necessarily need a case to review SIDH, um, understand the causes, uh, probably know most of the treatment options as well. Um, what we did at the end of the presentation uh, for the residents was a taste test um, comparing ours to the competitor and uh, most people liked ours especially mixed with the uh, Gatorade powder which is the way I prefer it. Um, the scope of the problem hyponatremia is obviously very common we know that um, it can be as common as 40 percent in hospitalized patients um, it is associated with increased morbidity and mortality which we'll talk about and SIDH is the most common cause of chronic hyponatremia. Uh, we had gone through a case of a patient who came into my office um, hypertensive, euvolemic, um, but was sent for a low sodium. Um, you could see there the uric acid was low, which is kind of a clinical pearl that this may be SIDH. The thyroid and cortisol tests were within normal limits. Um, we had done urine studies, which showed a very high urine sodium, which is also consistent with SIDH. Um, urine sodium plus potassium was greater than the serum sodium, which tends to lend itself to the thought that fluid restriction alone wouldn't work. Um, also, the urine osmolality being above 500 uh, is consistent with fluid restriction, probably not uh, working. Um, and so, of course, uh, we did a uh, kind of a cancer screening and made sure the patient was up to date, which they were. There was no obvious signs of cancer uh, reported. Um, we, the patient was fluid restricted, I, I think, before they saw me. Um, and you could see there their serum sodium didn't really move much. It went up from 125 to 127. And actually, the urine was, if anything, more concentrated. So the patient was still at risk. We had gone through, you know, what do you do? Do you kind of ignore it? Um, it's good enough. Do you get more aggressive? Um, do, you, do you add Lasix, um, something else perhaps? We had talked about some of the diagnostic criteria for SIDH um, using the Schwartz criteria here. I think most of you guys are aware of these things, um, having a higher urine osm, a high, higher urine sodium, uh, having normal thyroid and adrenal functions, typically normal uh, renal indices, uh, make sure the patient's not on diuretics, and some of these other pearls that we talked about, like having low serum uric acid. They also tend to have low BUNs. Um, some of the differential diagnoses we had gone through, cerebral salt wasting, which I'm going to skip over. Um, we also looked at uh, other look-alikes like hypothyroidism. It usually has to be very severe hypothyroid, um, adrenal insufficiency. Um, we talked about some of the consequences of untreated hyponatremia, even if it's mild, 
we know that there's increased risk for mortality, falls, osteoporosis, and just general attention deficits, which they've actually studied and shown that it's similar to alcohol intoxication, um, kind of what we, what we call the low-sodium brain fog, which our clients also um, confess is, is accurate. Uh, and this was looking at a prospective population-based study that actually showed an increase in mortality uh, for those patients who have hyponatremia, um, even mild cases. Uh, another study showing increase in falls uh, versus matched cohorts as well as fractures um, despite having similar uh, bone mineral density. Um, in that study, the authors concluded um, that hyponatremia would be a risk factor for fractures in the elderly. Um, and There's an arrow there pointing to the age. Uh, these patients were about 70 years old, um, and even mild hyponatremia um, uh, should be treated. Uh, another study, case control study, um, of a nice uh, selection of patients, 122, also around 70 years old, and a mean sodium of 126 were looked at. Uh, and they did find overall increase in falls, uh, 21% versus 5% in the hyponatremia group, um, which actually is a fourfold increase. And you can see even at the kind of modest sodium levels of 127 to 132, um, there was a high rate of falls. Um, some of these patients were also uh, looked at in a little bit more detail um, where they compared kind of treated hyponatremia versus untreated and, and they used uh, each patient as its own control subject. We had gone through the evaluation of the gate, how they did it. Um, it's kind of complicated, uh, but needless to say, uh, the gate was um, uh, worse, you know, more, more trouble uh, walking, um, more staggered kind of gait in the hyponatremia patients versus uh, themselves treated. Um, the gait instability also was compared hyponatremia versus folks who consumed a modest amount of alcohol um, and actually the hyponatremia patients performed worse um, in gait testing versus the alcohol patients um, and this sort of talks about that the low so sodium brain fog is real <laughs> um, based off of this sort of uh, trial and looking at compared to alcohol um, and so patients with chronic hyponatremia uh, do have more falls, do have more fractures, um, and perhaps we need to be taking it a little bit more seriously when you have a patient with uh, chronic hyponatremia in your office that we need to be a little more aggressive with our treatment strategy. Um, osteoporosis, uh, so increase, uh, this was rats looking at three months of induced hyponatremia, um, and they actually did have decreased bone density uh, in the hyponatremia rats versus normonatremia. Um, also, the NHANES data looked at this and found that mild hyponatremia in humans showed a uh, approximate threefold increased risk of osteoporosis. And then um, we talked about the treatment and, and if it overall does help. This was a meta-analysis showing um, there was benefit in mortality um, if you treated the hyponatremia on, on, at a meta-analysis level. Um, and we, you know, we talk about how it's tricky, you know, it's not always so easy to uh, treat hyponatremia. Um, your options are fluid restriction with a high protein diet, which probably wouldn't have worked in the case uh, study that we talked about. Fluid restriction with salt tabs, same problem. Um, there's Lasix and salt tabs. There's Tolvaptan, and of course there's our friend Urea. Uh, so fluid restriction alone has been shown to be um, not very well effective. Uh, up to 60% or so of patients will not respond to fluid restriction alone. Um, and it's important to check that urine uh, electrolytes and look at the urine osmolarity. And, osmolality. and as we talked about, the uh, serum sodium plus serum potassium, if that's greater, or excuse me, the urine sodium plus the urine potassium, if that's greater than the serum sodium, then it's unlikely that a patient's going to respond to fluid restriction and or if the urine osm is greater than 500. Um, here was a study looking at fluid restriction therapy for chronic SIDH, and what they basically showed is that 40% of the patients um, on fluid restriction alone did not reach um, a normal sodium or above 130 in this uh, 46 patients with SIDH. <clears throat> 
So the authors in that study concluded that fluid restriction, although it did help to some degree, um, and, it, and it had a modest early rise, um, there was minimal additional rise afterwards, and over a third of the patients failed to reach even above 130, and that's after multiple days of fluid restriction. Um, and they were just saying that there's more therapies that are needed for those patients. Um, this is that first ratio that we talked about, that basically if the serum, if the urine sodium plus urine potassium um, is greater than uh, the serum sodium and or the urine osmosis above 500, these patients tend not to do well um, with fluid restriction. They also talk about if you're in that 0.5 to 1 ratio that a 500 ml fluid restriction may work, um, but I call that cruel and unusual punishment to put somebody on that minimal of a fluid restriction. Um, that's a tough one for patients. So usually if you're seeing you know, low urine electrolytes, uh, lowish urine osm, you should get away with it. Um, but if you're seeing you know, close to a 1 ratio or, or, or uh, certainly above a 1, you need to consider other options. Um, a FUSE fluid trial came out fairly recently in 2020. This was a good study where they looked at uh, fluid restriction versus uh, Lasix versus fluid restriction Lasix and sodium chloride tabs. Um, basically, they showed at day four, um, the sodium did increase by about five um, in all participants uh, combined uh, with not a lot of difference between the three arms. Um, there was a trend towards increased AKI uh, in the patients on Lasix, um, and there was also a decreased potassium level um, with some of the more intensive interventions with the Lasix. Um, and so the conclusion is compared to fluid restriction alone, Lasix with or without salt uh, didn't really further improve treatment of hyponatremia and SIADH and did lead to a, a trend towards more AKI and certainly more hypokalemia. Um, so it's not necessarily recommended to use this method for treating SIADH, especially in the chronic setting. Um, and that's talking about that. More AKI and hypokalemia in the Lasix group. Um, so we talk about urea. Uh, urea has been used actually since the 1980s, um, mostly in Europe, originally in Belgium, Dr. Decaux. Um, it's an osmotic diuretic. It also decreases sodium excretion, so it decreases naturesis. Typical doses are about 30 grams a day, um, and urea was considered a good alternative in the treatment of patients with SIDH. Uh, who present with chronic hyponatremia despite fluid restriction. Um, and this is talking about a study from the 1980s, in fact, 1980. Uh, urea was actually looked at versus tolvaptan. This was in a C. Jason study in May of 2012. I really like this study because of this chart. The picture shows a thousand words here. Um, you look at one year, first of all, on uh, Vaptan therapy in chronic hyponatremia patients, and you see uh, you know, folks with SIDH, you see that the Vaptan worked well. It kept the sodium level above 135. You see that those patients came off the Tolvaptan for eight days, and their sodium level dropped right back down. Then you put the patients on urea therapy, um, and you see a similar trend uh, into the normal sodium range um, also for one year. So this basically uh, helped guide the European best practice guidelines to say, you know, we ought to be using urea uh, more than tolvaptan because urea uh, works well. Uh, it's shown to be effective here in this case for one year or more, um, and it's a heck of a lot cheaper than tolvaptan, which, you know, in America, uh, tolvaptan is at least $300 a pill um, versus our unflavored urea which is about a buck fifty uh, per dose um, or, or less, um, and so you know, in 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 our opinion, of course, we'd like to see more folks using the unflavored urea aid urea, uh, as this will be uh, equally effective, um, very safe, uh, with minimal uh, adverse effects compared to things like tolvaptan or Lasix plus salt tabs, um, which can cause you know tolvaptan, of course, can cause liver toxicity. Um, it really is only meant to be for 30 days uh, prescription, only post-hospitalization, at least in, in America. Um, and, of course, the fear of overcorrection and things of that nature. Uh, we talked about Lasix and salt tabs causing more AKI, potentially more hypokalemia, and not really being of that much benefit um, versus fluid restriction alone. Um, this just shows the European best practice guidelines, which does show uh, urea as uh, basically a second line behind fluid restriction.
um, at doses that are typical, which would be 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 grams per kg per day. Um, they also shy away from tolvaptan specifically in, this, uh, in these guidelines. So urea works really well um, because it is 60 grams per mole. Uh, molar mass and therefore a 30 gram dose of urea is 500 millimoles of solute. Uh, if your SIDH has a fixed urine osm of about 500, then that 500 millimoles of solute will lead to one liter of uh, water diuresis. If we remember these kind of very simplified Edelman equation, we know that if you're able to hold on to salt and decrease your total body water, then that ratio of the serum sodium level uh, will increase um, and we'll see the uh, blood sodium level rise. Um, salt tablets aren't great um, because you really give them one gram at a time and so uh, one gram of sodium chloride is about 34 millimoles of solute um, and so you just need a lot of salt pills um, to even come close to uh, what urea can do with uh, one dose. And so just conclusions uh, from this talk that we gave that hyponatremia is common. Um, it's, it's proven to be uh, both increases in morbidity and mortality. Um, it's linked to falls, fractures, attention deficits similar to alcohol and osteoporosis. Um, that the treatments that are out there aren't as effective as we'd like to believe. Um, things like Lasix and salt tabs, fluid restriction, or tolvaptan. And so urea, especially our urea aid urea, is a great inexpensive way to treat chronic hyponatremia. Um, and you know, we can be found again on Amazon. Um, no prescription is needed. It is a medical food. We do sell internationally. Um, and the best place and the lowest cost is ureaaid.com. And uh, I thank you so much. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We're at Kidney Aid. Uh, we are also on YouTube. Thanks, everybody, for the opportunity. Take care. Bye-bye.